Today, it's all about uh, the discussion on advocacy, and um, we want to ground that uh, in what's been happening around us in the past year and a half. The COVID-19 crisis has exposed systemic problems that migrant women workers have long understood. Informality in the economy, weak healthcare systems, lack of a social safety net, structural racism, gender discrimination, precarious jobs, and inhumane migration regimes. Moreover, migrant women have shown that they are so-called essential, essential workers, providing medical care, working in home care, especially with children and the elderly, working throughout the food chain, supply chain, cleaning industries, and much more during this pandemic and in an ongoing way. All these sectors have traditionally been undervalued, underpaid, and exploited, and this has not changed during this pandemic. Yet this critical period has also demonstrated that migrant women workers are leading resistance movements globally. Migrant women workers are, um, have always played a strong role in grassroots activism, yet in the corridors of power, they are far too often um, uh, invisible. Today, we're joined by four courageous women who have used different advocacy strategies to advance the rights of migrant women workers by using regional or global institutional spaces and instruments such as the ILO Domestic Workers Convention 189, which this year marks its 10th anniversary, the more recent ILO Convention 190 on violence and harassment in the world of work, and the 2018 UN Global Compact Pact for Migration, as well as other regional civil society initiatives, such as the Permanent People's Tribunal in Europe. Their experiences will shed light on how we leverage our feminist strengths to create gender responsive policy mechanisms today. What advocacy strategies targeted at improving labor migration policies have succeeded or failed? And how do we build a grassroots advocacy movement towards an intersectional feminist agenda by and for migrant women workers? I'm really, really pleased to um, introduce to you and for us to hear from uh, four amazing organizers and leaders. Um, they include Francia Blanco from Citra do Trans, in uh, Nicaragua, Fish Ip from the International Domestic Workers Federation, Jill Belisario from Fair Work, and Tola Ositelu from the International Trade Union Confederation. And we're going to start um, uh, with Fish. Um, Fish is currently the Asia Regional Coordinator for the International Domestic Workers Federation. Ms. Ip is a union organizer for domestic workers. She's the founding organizer for the Hong Kong Domestic Workers General Union, established in 2001, and the Hong Kong Federation of Asian Domestic Workers Unions, founded in 2010. Fadwu organizes local and migrant domestic workers with different nationalities. She started to work at the regional as the regional coordinator for the International Domestic Workers Network in 2009, towards the adoption of the International Labor Convention 189 on domestic workers. And this whole session on um, advocacy that we're doing, we wanna learn from the experiences of people like Fish and the domestic workers on, on how you went about organizing um, for what, one of the most amazing successes we've had in recognizing that domestic workers work. Uh, so how did you organize around 189 and what would it take for migrant women workers to put their labor rights on the global agenda in a similar and complementary way today? Fish, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for the organizers and everybody who is joining here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Fish from the International Domestic Workers Federation. The Federation is um, the uh, membership, uh, the affiliates are membership based organizations of domestic workers uh, around the world. Currently, we have some over 80 uh, affiliates from 63 countries 
um, we have organized over 600 domestic 600,000 domestic workers around the world. Um, the C-189 is uh, a big victory for all of us. Uh, I was very um, happy and feel honored to be among with the domestic workers, sisters and brothers in this victory and in the fight. And the victory is based from, and it's done by the domestic workers who have been working in many private households, who have been denied to communication even, day offs and a lot of labor and human rights that, uh, and abuses that they are, uh, they are facing. So the C189, which the International Labour Convention 189 Decent Work on Domestic Workers was adopted in 2011, June 16. So June 16 is our International Domestic Workers Day since then. Um, before that, uh, we did have uh, a lot of mobilization uh, to fight for this co International Labour Convention. Uh, we have had domestic workers organized in different places. Um, the leadership have been reaching out to the domestic workers here and there, discuss on the issues and rights. And then in 2006, thanks to the International and Global Union Federation, like Regal and IUF, uh, and many others, uh, regional and international organizations. There are several, over 10 uh, organizations who came together and bring the domestic workers organizations and leaders together in 2006 uh, at a conference in the Netherlands. And at that labor, and, and that first global conference of domestic workers, um, the, the outcome was that we have decided that, uh, first of all, we won an international, international labor convention for domestic workers to formally and internationally recognize domestic workers are workers and our rights. And the domestic workers leadership was also very clearly saying that domestic workers have to speak on themselves and domestic workers represent domestic workers. And I think this is the key. And this is, has been the thing that we have, uh, we have been adopted uh, since in, in the journey we are together. Uh, when we, in 2009, when we formed the IDWN, the network of domestic workers. And then from 2009 to 2011, we mobilized from the country level to the regional, and also to the international level uh, at the UN building, at the IO conference to negotiate on the uh, C189, the Convention on Domestic Workers. So, uh, and, and in the process, um, domestic workers spoke, themse spoke for themselves and they represent themselves. Uh, we have domestic workers leadership in the negotiation speaking on the table. Um, although it has not been easy because uh, governments, many of them are employers on the negotiation table, employers, workers, many of them are employers of domestic workers. So there are still many uh, traditional and cultural thinking uh, uh, considering domestic workers are maids and servants and they should not be enjoying day off, they should be taking care of the family, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, at the end, we were able to got the convention, which recognized domestic workers as workers, and we should have the rights enjoyed um, as like the other workers. And in the convention, it recognized domestic workers in different forms, including the migrant domestic workers. And it was, or it was said that um, the migrant domestic workers should not uh, be abused. Um, there should be protection from the exploitation uh, against the excessive agency fee. There should be a written contract. Um, there should be a proper process in the um, passage to and from their home countries between the designations. 
So I think um, this has been a very uh, happy and joyful journey, but that is not the end. That is only the first small step. Recently, the I.O. has, has um, uh, launched its report on the Convention of Nine and to reveal how the country and the governments has been doing since the adoption of the Convention of Nine. And still, um, 30, over 30% 30 of the domestic workers are excluded from the labor law and policy. And in Asia, over 60, around 64, five per percent um, domestic workers are excluded from the labor protection. So, and in Asia, especially the region where I come from, uh, only one country until now, only Philippines has ratified the convention, C-189, and has the domestic workers law and has some social protection scheme, including domestic workers. In the Middle East and the Gulf where uh, a huge amount, huge number of migrant domestic workers are hired. Uh, they are denied um, uh, basic human and labor rights. And uh, as you have read from the news, there's ongoing exploitation and very serious abuses happening. So um, in that sense, uh, we hope, um, I'm, I have my time finished, so we hope all of you can allow and support uh, domestic workers, especially migrants, to have space uh, to allow them to be organized, to have day offs for them, to have uh, rights for them to form a unions and access to justice and communication. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Fish, for, for that overview. Um, it was interesting. I picked up um, from what you were saying. I mean, central, the most central point was that domestic workers organized themselves and it was domestic workers' voices and roles in the negotiation um, that, that played such a central role. Uh, but it was also interesting to hear about the event that you did in 2006 with the support of global unions to, to decide to move forward on, on the convention um, and then creating a, a, an international organization that was able to do the lobbying from 2009 to 2011 um, and then the direct role in negotiations. So um, that, that's an important roadmap for our, our thinking about this kind of global organizing. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And we'll come back. Um, I want, now want to introduce Jill Belisario of Fair Work. Uh, Jill is representing the transnational migrant platform in Europe. Uh, she was, they were co-convener of the 45th session of the Permanent People's Tribunal on the violation with impunity of the human rights of migrant and refugee peoples. Um, and in the Netherlands, she works with Fair Work supporting migrant workers experiencing labor exploitation. Jill, welcome. Can you tell us about your experience around the Permanent People's Tribunal and how it particularly addresses the rights of migrant women workers from a gender and intersectional perspective? We're happy to have you with us. Thank you very much, Carol. And thank you very much again uh, for the organizers. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, it's always good to have a continuous conversation on um, how to go forward. Um, uh, I am actually representing two hats here. I have the Fair Work and then the Transnational Migrant Platform in Europe. I thought it's important to include because Fair Work is, um, that's my effort on really giving support uh, and um, support directly to migrants. Uh, uh, workers who are experiencing labor exploitation in the Netherlands and TMPE is more on uh, uh, working on another level, which is much more uh, uh, trying to achieve systemic change. Um, um, so just a very short introduction for work is actually supporting migrants uh, who are experiencing labor exploitation in the Netherlands and normally we receive around uh, this year, for example, which was very high uh, within the COVID, we receive around 1,000 um, persons who seek for support uh, in our network. Um, uh, sorry, within Fair Work, um, who who are uh, experiencing labor, uh, who maybe were 
were, um, sorry, victims of human trafficking. Um, within Fair Work, gender perspective is an inter integral component in our support. Um, we uh, give attention to sectors, specifically attention to sectors in which women are predominantly present in our support. Uh, we advocate uh, um, so, such as uh, domestic work and care work that these sectors are mostly invisible to society as work is carried out behind closed doors in private sphere and most workers are not protected by the Dutch labor legislation. So we, we uh, advocate on uh, also at Europe level and on the national level, we uh, have continuous conversations with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs in relation to um, uh, on, on the urgent separation between the control on labor rights on migration and status. Uh, the fact that should, there should be a safe and effective complaint mechanism for migrant workers who face labor abuses despite of their migration status. So that's from Fair, fair Work perspective. And from the Team PE, I'm coming to, to your question, Carol. Uh, from the P, Team PE perspective, as mentioned uh, also on the fact that the rights violations that migrants and refugees are experiencing, uh, such as labor exploitation, are not simply bad attitudes, but part of negative aspects of Europe that are closely linked to capitalism that is aiming towards domination, expropriation, and business, both economically and socially. Uh, from its formation in 2008, the MP has shared with its co-conveners a common analysis on inequality not only that labor of migrants are being locked into a low, lower so-called unskilled, low pay employment or work opportunity, including the next generations, but also an inequality in structural racism, sexism, and in access to fundamental human rights. And within the current prevalence of social fascism, social and labor relations are perme permeated within segregation violence, precariousness, and indifference, and democracy empties itself of meaning ceasing to recognize all peoples as subjects of rights. So having said that, a transnational migrant platform uh, in Europe um, is always seeking for systemic change. We have been engaging in different forums to bring the voices of migrants and refugees as well uh, on, on the international level, but also at Europe level. But in 2016, actually, during our conference, we decided to focus in Europe. Uh, we decided to initiate a longer term strategy that required a sustained approach of intersectionality and cross community and cross sector organizing alliance building, strengthening a new protagonism and that will be led by migrants and refugees and their organization. To reject the policy of criminalization of peoples on the move the proliferation of detention camps and deportation, including the use of private corporations for policy implementations, as well as the externalization and militarization of borders, as in North Africa and Turkey at that moment, which, uh, which we thought, we also think that is being very much normalized at this moment in the EU path. So we decided to approach the Permanent People's Tribunal to hold its 45th session on the violation with impunity and the human rights of migrants and refugees. From 2017 up to 2020, we held seven hearings in different cities. And um, uh, so based on the testimonies given, the PPT judges has concluded that immigration and asylum policies and practices of the EU and member states constitute a denial of fundamental rights of people and migrants and are veritable crimes against humanity, even though they may not be personally ascribable to individual perpetrators, according to the commonly agreed criminal law definition, they must be recognized as system crimes. The violations with impunity are justified in an architecture of overall EU and member state policies, which result in on ongoing genocide and criminalization of solidarity. So, as a movement, we decided that there is a, another kind of um, strategy or uh, uh, solidarity among us. No? The, the, so the, we propose to build a global, global pack of solidarity on the rights of migrants and refugees. We are calling to restore the primacy of human rights of individuals and peoples over the benefits and interests of states, oligarchies, and transnational 
uh, corporations and that we should promote self-determination, democracy and food sovereignty, making possible sustainable, supportive and fair local economies that guarantee the population uh, their right to live in dignity in their territories. Um, so until now, we have been bringing this goal for solidarity in different forms, such as social forms on migration, Asia Europe forms, and we have gathered around 600 um, support from movements and individuals, academes, trade unions, and academic institutions. And uh, eventually together um, in Europe, we will be holding um, a caravan from cities where the, where the hearings were he uh, held and to um, cities to cities to develop together an inclusive discourse on human, uh, human mobility where all people have access to fundamental, fundamental rights. And we are calling for, we are all migrants and refugees and to migrate and seek refuge is a human right. So let's, let us build a, a global pack of solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, and uh, next uh, session, the fifth session, we'll be talking about um, organizing, uh, women worker-led organizing. And of course, what you're pointing out is that organizing is essential to any advocacy work and that, that what you're doing through the tribunal is building a common framework and linking across Europe um, mi migrant organizations and migrant migrants themselves. In, in an organizing strategy. Um, and and I'm, I'm just curious as a, uh, just a, a, a couple second follow-up, did it get media attention in any way or was it um, intentionally ignored by the media when you did the tribunal in 2016? Yeah, um, in different cities, it got some, um, it got some uh, attention from the media, but of course our, the call on uh, that it's a systemic, um, uh, the, the, that it is a systemic crime, it is still a very difficult uh, thing to be heard by people. So it's not yet yeah. a narrative that is easily um, uh, accepted. So, but yeah. we got some attention and um, most importantly from uh, organizations uh, on the ground. So that was uh, great. Thanks. And I think that the, the, the base building strategy has longer term impact as, as, as you do this. So. That's great, thank you. I want to introduce Tola Ositelu from the International Trade Union Confederation. She's the project officer and the coordinator in the Equality Department at ITUC with a particular focus on gender and the global governance of migration. She recently contributed a piece on the, in, to the International Union Rights Journal about the experiences of West African migrant women workers in the Middle East Europe and elsewhere on the African continent. Welcome Tola. In the experience of ITUC, what are the entry points and pitfalls of the UN Global Compact for Migration to advocate for the rights of migrant women workers? How can we bring a feminist and intersectional analysis to the advocacy strategy around the Global Compact? Uh, are there any examples of, of how that is happening or how we might do that work? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, I will share my screen and do my best to answer those uh, quite comprehensive questions in seven minutes. Um, wait, so I'm just going to share my presentation. Now, the ITUC recognises that the GCM forms a normative framework and is not legally binding. Nevertheless, even as a framework, it carries weight. Amongst laudable aspects, such as looking at diverse factors that compel many to migrate, there are sadly some missed opportunities. Most notably, the GCM's weakness in enshrining access to fundamental rights and protection for migrant workers. The BWI's Amber Eusen, who's also the chair of the Council of Global Unions Working Group, observes a weakening of language in the compact regarding access to migrant services, justice and labor rights for migrants, particularly those with an irregular status. The International Trade Union Confederation's own General Secretary, Sharon Burrow, decries what she describes as a two-tier system or the reinforcement of a two-tier system amongst workers and creating an underclass of worker. This is automatically a gendered issue. 
Women make up almost half of the world's 260 million migrants and nearly half of migrant workers. Migrant women are predominant in a number of sectors most at risk of low pay, poor working conditions, insecurity and general exploitation. We know very well, for instance, or many of you know that the health and care sector worldwide, 70% of the, world, the workforce of, these, of this sector or these sectors is female. There's also the informal sector where, for instance, in the developing world, many women would be street vendors or unlicensed hairdressers. And there's also the notorious garment sector, particularly in Southern Asia. The work that is often the most low paid or demeaned is stereotypically associated with being women's work, quote unquote. I think domestic workers, as Fish would have outlined earlier, are a very good example of where several of these factors intersect. Their work is often low paid, it's undervalued, and it's um, the, um, sorry, excuse me, I've lost my place. Um, it's undervalued and it's often um, uh, comes with very low protection. For instance, um, and the vast majority of these workers will be women. In the European context, an estimated 70% of domestic workers are employed on an informal basis because of how difficult it is to obtain regularized status. We know how closely having a regular migration status is linked to access to social protections and numerous rights. Although we commend the GCM's efforts to provide a comprehensive and right-centered approach to migration, and we welcome the involvement of the unions, obviously during the compacts negotiations, we are disappointed by the shortfalls, which seem to have been driven sadly by the scaremongering and rightward drift of several European states. Note, for example, the failure to push for better routes to regularization of, of migration or permanent residence and citizenship, or the failure to challenge the practice of treating migration as a criminal rather than an administrative matter, as has been mentioned earlier by um, other speakers. I've just highlighted here a section from Objective 11, which in very euphemistic, slightly nicer terms, refers to border controls as border management, but it's the same criminalized undertone. And whilst the compact works admirably towards the end of child detention, the it doesn't go far enough in calling for an end to immigration detention altogether. Detention leads to the separation of families, as does the aforementioned difficulty in obtaining long-term citizenship. In heavily so-called feminized sectors, such as health and social care, many countries, high-income countries, recruit migrant workers from poorer nations on a temporary or circular basis. Now, in the long term, this practice is discouraged by the ITC and many in the movement for perpetuating both work and immigration insecurity. It doesn't allow pathways to family unification or permanent citizenship. And this results in women and men leaving their own families behind. And this has an obvious, obvious knock-on effect in the countries of origin, particularly as certain social norms remain stubbornly in place. Many of these migrant women will also be the primary carer or, and, and be responsible for the bulk of the unpaid care work back in the country of origin. So when they leave for the destination country, they're leaving behind loved ones without their primary carer. And often in contexts where there isn't much to be said about uh, national safety nets or social protections. And that's not to mention the brain drain aspect of this uneven exchange between origin and destination countries, where high income countries benefit from the expertise of lower income origin countries, and those, these countries themselves do not have the investment in the infrastructure that would retain this talent. Now, how do we bring a gender responsive and intersectional approach to the advocacy around migration? This is, I'm going to give you some examples of work in which the ITC is involved, although this is not exhaustive. Needless to say, gender justice is at the center of any serious advocacy for migrants' rights, including and beyond the GCM, which I've tried to outline. At the moment, the ITC is part of a couple of UN migration network thematic working groups. Uh, we've recently, for example, for example, contributed to a report on what Global Union Federation actions are going on around circular and temporary migration, uh, including campaigning to end it on a long term basis. And this was commissioned by the ILO. The ITUC is also a member of a multi partner working group on bilateral migration agreements. And we're currently putting the finishing touches to guidance and good practices with a strong emphasis on gender responsiveness, including the involvement of gender justice organizations and activists and trade unionists in the drafting of these agreements. 
The ITUC and its affiliates maintain these agreements are not a substitute for good migration governance or right-centred migration policies. They merely serve as a complement and we're vigilant to make sure that that is respected. The ITC is also involved in the mon monitoring the progress of and offering technical support to affiliates, campaigning for the ratification of Convention 189, and Fish has referred earlier to the ITUC's involvement in that pivotal uh, instrument, as well as Convention 190, which I know um, Francie will be discussing in more at length later on. And um, it pertains to the world of um, Convention 190 pertains to uh, freedom from uh, ha harassment and violence in the world of work. And um, the push for the ratification of these uh, conventions, um, and uh, sorry, I must add that Convention 190 is, um, comes into force today, two years after its adoption. And the push for the ratification of these kinds of conventions over the past decade are a really positive example of the efficacy of union involvement in these issues. Convention 190 foregrounds gender-based violence and its risks in the, in the context of work and beyond. We know that women and LGBTQ workers are particularly at risk of workplace violence. And this risk is even greater for women working in specific sectors, such as the informal sector or domestic workers, as well as for racialized and migrant women workers. The trade unions were absolutely pivotal and instrumental in making sure that domestic violence was recognized as an occupational health and safety risk in Convention 190, as particularly women trade union activists. Now, without ignoring the challenges, there have been a number of notable successes. So as well as the ratification of C-189 in dozens of states, Convention 190 is now on its sixth ratification, Uruguay being the latest country, and that's only within its two year history. And considering that this is within the context of a pandemic that's taken up at least half of that time, if not more, that is particularly impressive. Moving on, some of our African and European regional partners, I will be finishing very, wrapping up very soon, um, some of our re African and re European regional partners, um, the trade union, such as the Trade Union Network for Med Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan Migration, and the German Foundation FES, have collaborated on a report that Carol mentioned in the introduction, based around the testimonials of West African migrant women across the MENA region and elsewhere on the African continent. This is called Testimonies of Migrant Women Workers in Senegal. It's available in both English and French and from the link at the bottom of the screen. And I'll also be posting that in the chat after my presentation. Lastly, in late 2020, the ITUC held two web conferences with some of the partners I've just mentioned who were involved in the report I've just referred to as part of the ITUC's interregional union networks on migration for Africa, the Americas and Europe. Uh, one of the fruits of this, uh, these discussions is a declaration that you're seeing a retweet of by one of our affiliates, the Trade Union, Union, the Trade Union Congress of the UK. And this is an advocacy and campaigning document. Um, we have a long and a short version. And um, the statement was uh, released to commemorate International Migrants Day last December. And amongst other things, it calls on governments to put a halt to harmful migration policies, such as the securitization on world borders, as well as to invest in decent green jobs that pay living wages and should be particularly targeted at women, black, disabled, and young workers. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank many thanks for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Tola, for that overview. And I think one of the things that's very clear um, in, in all of the advocacy work we're discussing is the central role of trade unions in, in catalyzing um, uh, workers and other partners in, uh, in the regional and international advocacy. I think it's also um, very clear that um, from, from all of what everyone's saying and from your comments that getting um, a compact like the, the Global Compact for Migration or the conventions is really uh, just the beginning in terms of the need for the ongoing advocacy and pressure and organizing and mobilizing for, for um, ratification and implementation of those and uh, the kind of work that you are doing at the um, national and, and regional levels to specifically drill down on what that means and how that looks from an intersectional perspective is essential to um, uh, to have the outcomes we desire, uh, even though we've gotten some of these, we've achieved some of these in paper. 
it's also a, a helpful reminder um, uh, and I'm thinking to the negotiations of the global compact for migration um, of, of the big holes and the pieces that are missing in that compact. And it was helpful to hear uh, that we can't forget that, that we need to, to continue to um, uh, improve on what that might offer and, and address those gaps, even as we try to urge countries to engage in implementation. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to introduce Francia now, and I want to make sure that for those of you who are um, listening in English, which we've, uh, we've been doing with interpretation, we'll be moving to Spanish. She'll be speaking in Spanish, so be sure that you um, have uh, your um, interpretation on so that, you, um, so that you will hear it uh, with interpretation from Spanish to, uh, to English. Okay. I want to welcome Francia Blanco from Citra do Trans in Nicaragua. Francia is the leader and uh, founder of Citra do Trans, a union of trans domestic workers in Nicaragua. They're part of the Federation of Domestic Workers of Nicaragua. As a trans domestic worker from Nicaragua working in Guatemala, Francia experienced verbal and physical abuse, discrimination, and forced labor conditions, which led her to take action to build a world where trans domestic workers have rights, respect, and dignity on the job. Francia, bienvenida. Muchas gracias. Eh, eh, estaba justo, sí, estaba justo. Ah, ah, perdón, tengo que cambiar el, bueno. Um, Justo eh, um, Dola mencionó que la Convención 190 eh, es vigente hoy día. Eso es algo importante y, y sé que vas a hablar de eso. En relación al Convenio 190 de la OIT, ¿cuál es la campaña que lleva adelante Citrado Trans? ¿Qué ventajas tiene eh, la adop adopción de este convenio? Para las trabajadoras domésticas trans, por favor. Bueno, este, primero que todo quiero agradecer la invitación a tan importante evento y actividad, agradecida por haber tomado en cuenta a un sector de mujeres que por mucho tiempo ha sido discriminada y estigmatizada. Sabemos que la población trans y de la comunidad LGBTI a nivel mundial vive este, vejaciones y violencia, obvio, en otros países más que en otros y en otras regiones más que en otras. Sabemos que en Nicaragua, que es un país de la región latinoamericana, existe un gran arraigo a una cultura machista que, obviamen que obviamente viene de épocas anteriores y que ha sido fundamentada por la formación de estos roles que estereotipan de manera negativa a las personas con una orientación sexual diferente o una identidad de género diferente. Soy una mujer transgénera, fundadora del Sindicato de Trabajadoras Domésticas y Oficios Varios Trans de Nicaragua, Citrado Trans, y perteneciente a la Junta Directiva de la Federación de Trabajadoras Domésticas y Oficios Varios de Nicaragua, Petradomov Nicaragua. Como mujer trans y feminista siempre he pensado que no puede existir una lucha feminista sin la inclusión de todas las mujeres. Y cuando me refiero a todas las mujeres me refiero a que no haya una distinción de raza, de sexo, de orientación sexual, de identidad de género, de clase social. Porque al fin y al cabo somos mujeres y estamos en una misma lucha por tratar de acabar o erradicar el machismo una pandemia, al igual que el COVID-19 que nos ha venido afectando, afecta a las mujeres a nivel mundial. Con respecto al convenio 190 en Nicaragua, sabemos que Nicaragua fue el segundo país a nivel regional en ratificar el convenio 190 y el cuarto a nivel mundial. Actualmente, nosotras eh, sabemos que contamos con una ley, la ley 666, que es la Ley de Adicciones y Reformas al Código 1, Título 8 del Código 
del trabajo de Nicaragua que dice en su artículo 1 que se reforma el artículo 145 de la ley 185 que dice que todas las trabajadoras y los trabajadores del hogar son aquellos que prestan servicios propios del hogar a una persona o familia en una casa de habitación, ya sea de manera habitual o de manera continua, siempre y cuando esto no, 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 no contribuya a que el empleador tenga algún lucro. Entonces, actualmente en Nicaragua, nosotros estamos implementando una incidencia para lograr una vigilancia y que hayan más inspectores en el cumplimiento de lo que es el convenio 189, ya que se han dado casos de discriminación y violencia física y verbal en contra de las trabajadoras domésticas del hogar, ya sea cisgéneras o transgéneras. Y también en algunos casos de acoso laboral por parte de los empleadores y familiares de los empleadores. Entonces, con el convenio 190, que para nosotras como mujeres trans es muy importante, porque tiene como principal fundamento erradicar, con la, violencia, erradicar la violencia y el acoso en el mundo laboral, un mundo en el que muchas veces las mujeres transgéneras no tenemos acceso, ya que sabemos que a nivel mundial las mujeres transgéneras en lo, por lo natural ejercemos el trabajo informal y hay un gran porcentaje de trabajadoras trans que ejercen el trabajo sexual. Actualmente en Nicaragua, en el sindicato, contamos con 200 afiliadas de la comunidad trans y LGBTI que ejercen el trabajo doméstico y oficios varios que no tenían conocimiento alguno de sus derechos laborales y del marco jurídico que existe en Nicaragua y que vemos a través de procesos de formación la necesidad de la ratificación en Nicaragua del convenio 190 para que nosotras como mujeres trans podamos tener acceso a un trabajo en el cual no seamos discriminadas, no seamos estigmatizadas y no seamos víctimas de violencia este, ya sea física, ya sea verbal, ya sea psicológica, ya sea económica, porque muchas veces por el hecho de ser trans nos contratan, pero somos explotadas laboralmente. Entonces este convenio va a venir a contribuir a que haya más vigilancia y que tanto las instituciones como las empresas privadas cumplan con este convenio que tiene la finalidad no solo de proteger al trabajador en su espacio laboral, sino al trabajador desde el momento en que va a solicitar trabajo. Y esto va a beneficiar a la comunidad LGBT que muchas veces es discriminada en las puertas cuando va a solicitar un empleo por su imagen, por su identidad, en el caso de nosotras, las mujeres trans. Nosotras tenemos una campaña actualmente en redes sociales que se llama Sí a la ratificación del convenio 190 de la OIT, de recomendación 206, que en algún momento le voy a compartir eh, en, por WhatsApp para que vean esta campaña, que tiene como principal este, protagonistas a las mujeres trans, a las mujeres trans que estamos demandando al Estado la ratificación de este convenio y a la misma vez la protección hacia la comunidad de trabajadoras domésticas en sus espacios laborales para ya no seguir siendo víctimas de tantas vejaciones a nuestros derechos humanos y de, de que todavía se siga tomando el trabajo doméstico muy por debajo de otros tipos de trabajo. Y eso obviamente va a contribuir a que nosotras como mujeres, cisgéneras o transgéneras, nos empoderemos y conozcamos este convenio. Considero que como mujer trans, en un mundo machista, hablar sobre violencia es bastante delicado. Entonces me imagino de que el trabajo para la ratificación del convenio 190 tiene que ser bastante sigiloso. Ya sabemos que los machistas aman la violencia y sabemos que la violencia se mueve por natural en un mundo de hombres, en un mundo de hombres que tienen privilegios por el simple hecho de haber nacido con un pene y que tratan de ver a las mujeres de menos y mantenernos en esa posición. Entonces hablar de violencia para ellos es hasta cierto punto peligroso porque este convenio habla del respeto que tienen que tener ellos tanto hacia otros trabajadores hombres como hacia otras trabajadoras mujeres y trabajadoras de la diversidad sexual en sus espacios de trabajo. Y también la igualdad, una igualdad que tiene que ser no solo en el trato, sino también en el salario, porque sabemos que existen desigualdades todavía con respecto a las ganancias netas entre hombres y mujeres, mucho menos entre mujeres trans, que a veces ni siquiera tenemos un salario este, 
formal, ni siquiera acceso a un salario mínimo, aunque la ley 66 establezca eso. Sabemos que siempre las empleadoras negocian sus trabajos muy por debajo del salario mínimo, pero a la hora de entablar una, de, de una denuncia, sabemos que el Ministerio del Trabajo siempre toma en cuenta la ley y es, calcula las prestaciones según la ley establecida y de esta manera se logra beneficiar a la trabajadora. Entonces, este, nosotras impulsamos una campaña en redes sociales, un lobby político constante con tomadores de decisiones, con otros sindicatos, con otras federaciones, con otras confederaciones existentes en Nicaragua, para unir fuerzas y lograr que en Nicaragua se ratifique el convenio 190, que como ya les he mencionado, es muy importante para todas las mujeres. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Francia. Um, I think you helped us uh, really center the reality that um, intersectional feminism means that we can't leave any group behind and that within groups of women, within groups of workers, within groups of domestic workers, there are groups that are um, uh, oppressed and exploited, exploited in additional and in multiple intersecting ways. And the reality of um, the economic marginalization, the violence experienced by trans women is one of them. And um, you also uh, reminded us again, as, as Jill did, that it's um, the trans domestic workers themselves who uh, are, are giving the leadership in the, in the campaigning. Um, but I, I noted once again that you all have organized um, uh, as a union and affiliated with unions and federations in, in the advocacy that you're doing. Um, and we're also reminded that of, of the incredible importance of um, Convention 190 against violence and, and harassment in the world of work and, and um, really the significant triumph that that has not only been uh, ratified in Nicaragua, but also um, implemented in, in law in, within the country. Um, and at the same time, as you remind us, it's constant vigilance um, to have that, uh, to move out of the informality of negotiating whatever wage from um, precarious situations to demanding that those law that that law be fulfilled and that's going to take your campaigning the social media and um, uh, certainly more inspectors as you're calling for um, and and the organizing that you're doing so thank you very much for that reminder we um, have uh, been talking for a long time and we're going to take a break uh, we'll take five minutes feel free to um, you know uh, turn off your uh, well, uh, most of us don't have uh, cameras on anyway as participants, but take a stretch, get a, a cup of coffee or something, and um, I'm not sure if it's possible, uh, but I'm wondering, Bobby, if you could put on the uh, fantastic uh, Filipino song that we heard at the beginning again as we take a break so that people who might have missed it, um, if you scroll up, uh, there's... Um, uh, the, the song is in uh, has the lyrics uh, at the top of... Um, comments in the chat as well. So we'll be back in five minutes to, to think about how these, uh, these experiences in or, uh, organizing and advocacy offer us some lessons for today. Thanks, everyone. As I mentioned, we're going to be um, thinking about how the advocacy work that was done around Convention 189, around Convention 190 of the ILO, um, around the Global Compact for Migration, and the kind of organizing advocacy at a regional level that um, Transnational Migrant Platform has been doing in Europe, how we can think about um, the ways that was done, the kind of coalitions that were built, um, the strategies that were used and um, uh, apply that to this moment. We're in a moment where we both have the victories of C-190 coming into force, 10 years of uh, Convention 189, um, uh, you know, some ratifications and changes into national law, um, which are um, huge, huge strides forward um, in uh, 
recognizing the rights and dignities of um, uh, of women workers. Um, and yet we also know, as we began talking about um, the enormous setbacks we're seeing in um, in terms of precarity of labor in the um, uh, mo the pandemic, how those have become very visible, uh, as as well as setbacks in migration policy that are intensifying criminalization, de detentions, deportation, um, and and hyper exploitation. And we know that there are many many um, sectors of workers um, uh, who continue to be excluded from uh, labor laws um, and. So we need a huge push forward. Um, and as Dilla pointed out in terms of the global compact for migration, we need to um, call out and reframe um, the, the uh, current paradigm around migration in a way that um, uh, will really demand full changes that will center uh, workers and center uh, migrant workers, women migrant workers, um, in, in all of their intersecting diversity. So we're gonna take some time now to think about lessons learned and uh, what that might mean for um, strategies for this moment. And I really wanna invite the participants to use the chat to help us uh, know about the advocacy organizing that you've been doing. We won't be able to um, address all of that today in the webinar, but we certainly want to be working with all of you to um, gather the lessons learned about what is effective advocacy led by um, women workers um, and uh, also what, what you think would be an, an, an essential, um, essential elements of a platform or of um, strategies uh, right now for how we move forward uh, at this moment. So please put those in the chat. Um, and uh, in a little bit, we'll also get to a question and answer session where you'll have a chance to, to post questions. So um, I want to just ask, what are the lessons learned that we can use to mobilize in this moment? And we'll ask that same question of all of the speakers. And let's start with you, Tola, um, uh, to reflect on that, please. Uh, I'm gonna pick up on something you just said, Carol, about um, uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. and looking, so I'm gonna hone in, home in on a particular aspect, I think an important aspect of strategy, but generally to observe, I think in terms of lessons learned, um, they are lessons we could have learned pre-pandemic. I think it goes without saying that um, the global health crisis has only emphasized pre-existing problems or co compounded them. But being the ornate optimist that I am, um, I see this as a watershed moment although we need to acknowledge that any positive change is not a given. And we've seen how regulating, managing or mismanaging the pandemic hasn't automatically led to epiphanies on the state or governmental level. Uh, focusing particularly on migrants, there's a, bit, there's a cognitive dissonance around the contributions of migrants, undeniable uh, before the pandemic and particularly during the pandemic, um, but then there's also this continued hostility towards migration. So I would say in terms of lessons learned or strategies moving forward, uh, we should start or continue with challenging at every turn the negative attitudes and rhetoric that problematizes migration and makes it a security issue, which I've referred to earlier, so did Gillian and other speakers, um, particularly when it relates to black and brown people from the global south. Current migration policies heavily favor the wealthy of Western origin, at least in the global north. So the converse, this conversation around migration and understanding migration, the framing around migration needs to happen at every level, not just in terms of policy and interaction with the state or as essential as that is, but also with friends and our circles of influence. You can see it as a form of polit grassroots political education, if you will. I personally have come a long way in the past decade or less so on my views around that issue, despite being a second generation migrant myself, um, you know, growing up in the UK, you'd, in the, particularly in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of negative uh, framing of migration and it being the root of all ills. So related to this, I would say, is the willful misinformation by states and media actors. The EU still speaks of, quote unquote, uncontrolled migration flows in that very problematic 
um, PAT, um, European PAT, to which Jillian referred to earlier as well. Um, whereas in reality, and I'm going to quote from uh, Hakima Haitha of the Global Coalition on Migration, Africa, for example, only accounts for only 14%, that's 1-4% of the global migrant population, according to a 2018 African migration report, whereas Europeans account for 24%. And 80% of the migration of Africans is intracontinental, so that means it remains on the African continent. Adding to this are oversimplified narratives about the causes of migration, such as conflating smuggling with human trafficking and other criminal activity. And this is cynically and disingenuously used by the likes of the British Home Secretary, Priti Patel, for example, to justify border controls and the criminalization of migration flows. Now, there are criminal elements involved in smuggling, but that's only part of the story and it's not true for every circumstance. There are families and communities who are networks who are also involved in helping migrants across borders, whether legally or otherwise. And to paraphrase multiple reports on this issue, border controls engender smuggling because migrants lack safer routes. It's not the cause of, of, of migration. Above all, I think we need to emphasize that migrants' rights are human rights. This is again, bringing it back to the intersectional approach. As well as merrily bankrupt, it's mis, it is misdirection when scaremongering politicians and media outlets stigmatize migrants and it's very deliberate misdirection. Sadly, this language is not the preserve of the far right. We've seen the drift of center left and so-called progressive parties who have um, capitulated to this rhetoric and embraced it. We've seen this in the UK, particularly pre-2015, and more recently and shamefully in Denmark. We know that someone isn't automatically a threat to national security merely because they've relocated from a poorer country. We know that migrants aren't the ones driving down wages. Instead, it's opportunistic employers taking advantage of states' light-touch regulation and policies that privilege profit for a shareholder few rather than the many who create the wealth. We know that at almost every indicator, whether it be quality of pay, work conditions, even access to paid employment, especially during the pandemic, women would be the hardest hit, um, particularly disabled women and or racialized women. The rights that benefit migrant workers benefit all workers, such as job security, good and humane working conditions and better wages. Just take, for example, the, the um, Fish mentioned the ratification of C-189 in the Philippines and the laws adopted to comply with that. That would not just benefit the domestic workers, but would have a positive indirect knock-on effect on other workers who've been in historically low paid and undervalued work. In addition, Better and more inclusive social protections are advantageous for all of society. So in conclusion, I would say solidarity amongst workers across the board, regardless of migration status and other demographics must be fostered and unions must lead by example. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tola. Solidarity regardless of status. I think the unions, uh, certainly ITUC is modeling that. We appreciate it. Um, uh, our, our next speaker to this question is uh, Jill Belisario. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Can, can you hear me now? Um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for that question, Carol. I within within our uh, current work, uh, also from from the from Fair Work uh, and Team PE. Later, I will explain the, the lessons learned. Um, so, uh, having a framework at the international level doesn't mean access to rights at at the ground. No, within Fair Work, we we see very much that. Um, especially those who are undocumented uh, uh, have difficulties in having access to, to their labor rights and also for, um, uh, um, yeah. So that means that at, at national level, we need more jurisprudence. We need more, uh, we need to strengthen the law and therefore needs to continue to give visibility to the issues that migrants and refugees are experiencing, the exploitation that they are experiencing. At the, at the Europe level, the, at the Team PE, um, I think that our challenge um, um, 
at this moment, our biggest challenge in Europe is finding the basis for convergence in Europe-wide campaign that unites various trends of struggles um, that we hold in common, migrants and refugees and citizens, especially in the context where European project itself is contexted. But we see the struggles as one for our shared humanity as human beings, as peoples who are human rights bearers and who have responsibilities for each other, a, pol a politics that is now also being advocated by, for example, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. There are many citizens also within the hearing, citizens, individuals and organizations and movements resisting alongside migrants and refugees in many different capacities, from organizing to standing bail, from advice to speaking out. We heard voices of resistance, including hunger and work strikes, even in the detention centers. We hear and witness the transborder solidarities and collective strategies of survival and resistance including people occupying the borderlands, those non-rights spaces, even when they are in the heart of Europe. But together we are also making new spaces like the tribunal, turning these borderlands into the sites of politics. We are linking our struggles with the struggles aggressive, addressing the extravism, extrativism of corporations and corporate driven development models. These struggles are also ours for food sovereignty, for climate justice, labor rights in our workplaces, gender and feminist struggles, rejecting racism and Islamophobia. Our numbers are growing and we say it, it is not a crime to migrate and seek refuge. It's a human right. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'm appreciating uh, in today's dialogue, you're um, being situated at, working at the national level and, and, and reminding us of, of that um, balance between international policy. And as you said, um, it, it, it doesn't mean access to rights on the ground unless the organizing is happening there. Um, okay, and our uh, next speaker on what are the lessons learned for organizing at this moment is Fish. Thank you, Carol. Um, the lessons learned, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic, we found that the, com the, the domestic workers leaders in the community, in the villages, in the base are so crucial because uh, we have lockdowns and social distancing measures. We cannot reach out to the, the other domestic workers who are in need, but these domestic workers leaders in the committee has been has helped a lot to keep on reaching out them to keep monitoring the situation of domestic workers to give uh, assistance to them so i think the the major lessons learned is that the base building of the workers to build up their confidence to be able to tell the issues, even though they are regarded as a very low class or caste woman and uh, the gender awareness raising is very crucial for them to allow them to realize why their situation is like this due to the social status, which is very low. And the uh, organizing uh, and the leaders to speak up is so crucial. And the other thing, especially in the pandemic, is that uh, we face more discrimination and xenophobia, as mentioned in Tola and uh, the previous panelists as well. Um, the, and and I, I think this is indeed show that the governments has not been doing anything uh, to tackle the issues of discrimination faced by the domestic workers and migrants, especially in the pandemic, when they are seen as a carrier of the COVID-19, when uh, the migrant domestic workers has to wash themselves, clean themselves up, uh, rejected for day offs, rejected to move around, and and this has kept them more violence that they are they faced. So we have to emphasize the convention, many of the human rights convention and labor convention, especially 189 and C-190 uh, with this standard to build up uh, with our argument to our governments on why having policies and laws uh, against discrimination is so important. 
uh, especially in this um, aging population in many richer countries, um, more um, attention has to give to the care economy and social protection of the people and the domestic workers and women migrants as well. They also have need for social protection um, like the others. So the IWF has the My Fair Home campaign as a way to simplify the languages of the Labor Convention C-189 um, into to explain what is uh, fairness to in the home, to exercise fairness in the home with the hiring of the domestic workers as a way to have dialogue with the governments, with the employers especially. And the other thing, uh, one of the friends posted a question here about the kafala system. Indeed, this is very, very crucial because uh, very often for migrants, um, it has been the immigration control um, that is override the labor, labor rights that the workers are supposed to have under the labor policies and laws if there are one. So the kafala system, uh, the sponsorship system, which tied the workers visa to the employers and restrict them to movement to other employment, restrict them to transition to other employment or even departure has to be abolished um, so that they can have freedom to move. And when they face abuse, they are able to seek help without being put into an undocumented and irregular uh, status and put them into more risks and dangers. We should not put the victims of abuse into more vulnerable situation. And the other issues for migrant that is faced a lot is the excessive agency fee. And there are affiliates of uh, IWF who, who started a direct hiring uh, campaign so that the migrant domestic workers can have can be less controlled by the agencies, but they can have uh, more control on their own employment. So all these are crucial lessons that we have learned. And I recognize the comment by Damai from Indonesia, how we, uh, how the feminist movement pushed for uh, the perspective of domestic workers into the migrant workers movement. And that is something that I experienced in uh, 2009 to 2011, when uh, I was there in Hong Kong to form the Federation of Domestic Workers with local and migrant domestic workers together. At that time, the mig one of the migrant domestic worker leader, um, uh, she's also an Indonesian, Ringatin, she said that uh, before she always feel that she is a migrant. But for the first time, she feel that we are domestic workers together with other nationalities, together with the local domestic workers. So that's why we have to fight for the convention. Thank you so much again. Thanks so much, Fish. The, the, that, that sense of solidarity that you achieved in Hong Kong of, of being not just migrant worker, domestic workers and um, national domestic workers, but being uh, domestic workers together is, is essential to that solidarity that we're talking about. And that it's, it's helpful to have, have that example. Um, and I, 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 you're definitely reminding us of, of the ongoing work of uh, the, the critical work of leaders at the, at the most local level, not only in the pandemic, but in an ongoing way in, in the implementation. So thanks a lot. I want to remind you again, we're going to turn to Spanish and um, ask you to um, be sure that you check your translation so that you'll be able to hear uh, interpretation from Spanish to English. Y quiero pedir que Francia aporte sus observaciones de que aprendizajes hay en, en las campañas que, han, uh, que uh, están haciendo y qué lecciones hay para uh, la movilización que podríamos hacer en este momento. Francia. 
Este, primero que todo voy a pedir disculpas porque voy a mantener la cámara apagada ya que hace problemas. Hace poquito tiempo tuve problemas de, de, inter, de, de conexión. Por supuesto. Me había enviado, me había sacado de la conversación y quiero evitar que vuelva a suceder para poder enviar o responder. Entonces voy a mantener la cámara así. Sí. De las principales lecciones aprendidas que tenemos nosotras como Sindicato de Trabajadoras Domésticas Trans y también como Federación de Trabajadoras Domésticas de Nicaragua, Petrado Mof, es el hecho de que el éxito de una campaña depende de la unión de fuerzas. Y con esto me refiero a que es muy importante tanto el trabajo de base con nuestras promotoras en el terreno, en las comunidades, como a otros niveles de incidencia o lobby político con tomadores de decisiones o directamente con la Asamblea Nacional de Nicaragua. Yo creo que una golondrina no hace verano. Una sola golondrina no hace verano y las trabajadoras domésticas tenemos que aprender a estar unidas porque la unión hace la fuerza. Hablando acerca del tema migratorio, acá en Nicaragua es un fenómeno existente desde hace muchos años atrás. Somos un país expulsor. Tenemos nicaragüenses en Costa Rica, en Panamá, en Estados Unidos, en España, en El Salvador. Y la mayoría de estos ejercen el trabajo doméstico porque más del 50% de estos migrantes son mujeres. No hay estadísticas específicas que nos digan cómo es el flujo, el flujo migratorio de la comunidad LGBTI, ya que sabemos que en los puestos fronterizos solo, solo se registran a las personas por su nombre legal y en Nicaragua no hay una ley de identidad de género, entonces las mujeres trans seguimos conservando este nombre legal. Entonces cuando pasamos por las fronteras no existimos. No hay datos, no hay índices que reflejen, pero sabremos por la realidad de nosotras como comunidad LGBTI que nosotras migramos por la discriminación que existe en nuestro país, altamente machista, pero también por el rechazo de nuestras familias y el poco acceso a los sistemas educativos y en salud. Nos vemos obligadas a tener que migrar a otro país y vivir una doble discriminación, primero por el hecho de ser diversas y segundo por el hecho de estar en un país y no conocer de los derechos que como migrantes tenemos en un país, en otro país. Entonces yo creo que es importante también acordarnos de esos compatriotas que están en otros países ejerciendo sus labores y trabajar desde nuestros países para crear políticas que incluyan también y beneficien a las trabajadoras domésticas no nacionales de los países donde se encuentran o trabajadoras domésticas migrantes, ya sean de la comunidad LGBTI o mujeres y género o inclusive hombres porque nosotras, a pesar de que somos un sindicato de trabajadoras domésticas trans, no excluimos a las otras identidades de la diversidad sexual. Tenemos afiliadas mujeres lesbianas, mujeres bisexuales, hombres bisexuales y también chicos gay que ejercen el trabajo doméstico, porque sabemos que el trabajo doméstico no solo es directamente en casa, sino también en jardinería desde el chofer. Entonces, incluirlos porque no podemos hablar de inclusión si nosotras estamos excluyendo dentro de nuestros propios espacios. Entonces tenemos que incluir en toda la escala a todas las mujeres y a todas las personas que ejercen el trabajo doméstico para que juntas tengamos un mejor mensaje que genere un poco más impacto. Y principalmente clamar por esta unión y por la defensa de los derechos humanos, laborales, de las mujeres trabajadoras domésticas. La pandemia nos ha dejado muchas lecciones, como lo es el caso de que no estábamos preparados para este tipo de situación. O sea que deberíamos de incluir dentro de nuestros protocolos y dentro de nuestros este, planes de trabajo, prever situaciones como esta que estamos pasando actualmente, como es la pandemia del COVID-19, que inclusive vino a generar mucho desempleo eh, en Nicaragua, en el sector doméstico y más en la comunidad LGBTI, que de por sí en Nicaragua las mujeres trans vivimos con menos de un dólar al día. Y ahora hablemos en una situación de desempleo en un país donde más del 50% de la población vive en pobreza y otro porcentaje en extrema pobreza. Entonces yo considero de que la inclusión es clave y la unión también es muy clave y eso lo hemos aprendido en el trabajo que nosotras hemos venido desarrollando porque el aprendizaje es día a día y siempre hay algo nuevo que aprender. Muchas gracias.
Muchísimas gracias, Francia, Francia y has subrayado la importancia de la unión y, y la inclusión. Y nos, nos hace acordar que aún en grupos que experimentan doble, triple tipos de exclusión, aún ahí, ahí hay, hay que pensar en la inclusión, ¿no? Como ustedes en um, uh, organizando trabajadores domésticos trans. Uh, y es, es, es algo importante de siempre estar uh, acordando quiénes están posiblemente eh, eh, siendo uh, excluidos y cómo podemos incluirlos. Bueno, um, uh, I'm going to switch back to English and uh, thank each of our speakers for um, those reflections on um, what kind of lessons we have and where do we go for here. And I'm going to pass uh, uh, on to my uh, co-moderator, Monica, to um, coordinate uh, uh, some time for questions and answers. Thanks, Carol, and thanks to our panelists. Um, we have a couple questions for you that are coming in through the chat box and the Q&A function. And I just like to remind our um, guests again, if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in the chat box or the, the Q&A, and we will pose that to our panelists. And um, Fish, you, you already helped us out by addressing a couple of those questions, so thanks. So I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to go to Francia. There were two questions uh, similar that came in for you, so I'm going to summarize. Um, your colleagues are wondering, how does your organization um, build those alliances that you spoke of? for joint advocacy between sex workers, domestic workers, LGBTQI organizations, and labor unions. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you go about that coalition building? Bueno, este, las mujeres trans somos activistas desde el hecho de que asumimos una identidad. Tengo 36 años, o sea que tengo a los 16 años asumí mi identidad. Tengo alrededor de 20 años de ser este, una activista de, de defensora de los derechos humanos de la comunidad trans en Nicaragua. Tuvimos la oportunidad de conocernos con otras líderes de la comunidad trans a nivel nacional en espacios de intercambio de prácticas y experiencias de organizaciones de sociedad civil LGBT acá en Nicaragua. Y tuvimos la oportunidad de conocer a doña Andrea Morales, que es la secretaria general de la Federación de Trabajadoras Domésticas de Nicaragua. Y platicando con ella, surgió la necesidad de crear un sindicato que defendiera los derechos laborales de la comunidad LGBTI, específicamente de la comunidad trans, pero sin obviar a las demás identidades en Nicaragua, ya que en Nicaragua se venía repitiendo un fenómeno que se repite en la región centroamericana, que es a las que a la mayoría de, de cooperantes internacionales siempre buscan a las mujeres trans por el tema de VIH o temas de prevención en VIH. Testeos o pruebas. Entonces, nosotras estamos cansadas de, de que asocien a la comunidad o a la diversidad con el tema de VIH o con el tema de prevención, porque nosotros tenemos otras necesidades. Obviamente es algo muy importante hablar de la prevención, pero también es muy importante hablar del acceso al trabajo, hablar de los derechos laborales, porque cómo vamos a tener una salud estable, una vida este, saludable si no tenemos trabajo, si no tenemos acceso al trabajo si no tenemos los recursos económicos para poder obtener esa canasta básica de alimentos que se necesitan para tener una salud adecuada, si no tenemos, este, si no se crean las habilidades o las, o las herramientas para que nosotras como mujeres trans nos profesionalicemos y accedamos a un sistema educativo. Entonces, obviamente, teníamos que cambiar de dirección, teníamos que hablar de este tema tan importante, unirnos y aprender de las que ya saben, de, la, de las que ya sabían, porque ahora nosotros ya sabemos cómo es el mundo del, del sindicalismo, cómo es la unión entre mujeres a nivel nacional, a nivel regional, a nivel de continentes, y cómo juntas a nivel mundial podemos lograr 
este, logros tan importantes como son las convenciones del 189 y ahora el 190 que dignifican el trabajo de las trabajadoras domésticas, pero que también nos colocan en una posición en la que nosotras estamos gozando de, de, de beneficios que antes no teníamos en Nicaragua y que ahora con la ley 666 ahora tenemos, como es el derecho a un salario mínimo, el derecho a una inscripción a un seguro social, el derecho a que se pague el salario. Obviamente, este, suena bonito lo que estoy diciendo, pero hay aspectos que no se cumplen, porque la ley ahí está. Pero tenemos que estar vigilantes en lo que es el proceso de la implementación, que es muy importante, porque sabemos que hay muchas denuncias que se han puesto porque los empleadores no quieren cumplir con esto. Pero también hay muchas denuncias acerca de casos de violación y casos de acoso y casos de discriminación hacia las trabajadoras domésticas por parte de los empleadores y familiares. Entonces, aprobar o ratificar en Nicaragua la Convención 190 es de suma importancia para reducir estos casos que al final a quien perjudican son a nosotras, a nosotras las trabajadoras domésticas, a nosotras las trabajadoras del hogar. Entonces, formamos el Sindicato de Trabajadoras Domésticas Trans y Tratran, que es el primer y único sindicato a nivel mundial de, de mujeres trans y comunidad LGBTI, y ahora estamos impulsando procesos de, de desarrollo, crecimiento, información en materia de derechos humanos, sindicalismo, eh, este, acompañamiento este, psicosocial, inclusive asistencia a, a compañeras que han retornado de otros países por la situación del COVID-19 y que ahora están buscando cómo reinsertarse económicamente dentro de, del país en un contexto este, actual, que es una nueva realidad, que es la del COVID-19, en la que tiene que haber mucha prevención y mucha protección, pero que sabemos dónde es que no contamos con esos recursos. Entonces, a través de, de, de esta unión de trabajadoras domésticas a nivel mundial, hemos logrado poder apoyar a compañeras con kits este, de higiene necesarios para la protección del COVID, con paquetes alimenticios necesarios para aquellas chicas que fueron este, corridas de su trabajo, que no cuentan con trabajo actualmente, pero también estarlas formando en materia de, de empoderamiento y en materia de derechos para que sean ellas quienes defiendan sus propios derechos, pero también que sean ellas quienes den acompañamiento a otras compañeras que las busquen y las soliciten porque quieran afiliarse en el sindicato o porque necesiten este apoyo porque están siendo víctimas este, de violencia, de discriminación o se están violentando sus derechos laborales en sus espacios de trabajo. Actualmente el sindicato tiene una alianza a nivel centroamericano, pertenece a una alianza a nivel centroamericana de organizaciones este, de comunidad LGBTI, este, tanto a nivel de Nicaragua como Honduras, eh, Guatemala y El Salvador. Y el, el principal propósito es promover la formación de sindicatos diversos en otros países, pero a la misma vez la inclusión de personas diversas a los sindicatos ya existentes, porque sabemos que hay personas diversas en diferentes sindicatos de trabajadoras este, del hogar a nivel mundial. Tal vez no se han asumido, tal vez no lo han dicho, pero es muy importante tocar este tema porque cuando hablamos de inclusión, hablamos de todas las mujeres. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Francia, and, and thank you for, for reminding us that it, it's really important that that we do not have um, any any groups of workers being placed in a box where workers have a whole raft of issues that impact them, a whole raft of, a raft of issues that they care about, and, and that through a union we can organize to approach this in a more holistic way. Thank you for, for your response. And a quick follow-up question to you from uh, Nari pa Poco, a, a women's organization in Bangladesh, um, asking, uh, do you have a domestic workers union in your country? Sorry, is it the question to me? Sorry, I have phone was ringing. In Nicaragua, <laughs> there are many domestic workers. No, because we are not a country of receptors of migrants, but we are expulsors. Pero sí hay organizaciones migrantes como Enlace Nicaragüense en Costa Rica que trabaja con las trabajadoras migrantes nicaragüenses que están en Costa Rica ejerciendo el trabajo. 
doméstico. Thank you. And I'm, I'm seeing some other, other um, comments from the chat box that in many countries there are domestic worker unions. There may not be a, a union, but there are at least organized workers, even if they may not have the legal right to form an official union um, on the books. Okay. All right, as questions, um, as questions are continue to come in, I'll, um, I'll take the, the moderator's privilege to ask one question and I'll direct it first to Tola, but I'll invite other panelists to, to also respond um, to this question. We know that within coalitions and even within feminist coalitions, we know that there are still issues internally with regards to racism and white supremacy, um, transphobia, anti-migrant attitudes and, and other biases that may create internal divisions even within our own movement. And um, Tola, you alluded to this a bit, but I'm wondering if you have experienced this in, in your work and, and what are your thoughts on what we can do to overcome this challenge? I think um, when I refer to the solidarity, particularly in my um, intervention, uh, my second intervention, I was thinking in terms of sort of migration status in particular, because obviously we're focusing on migrant uh, women migrant workers today, and sort of historically, and some sadly, some movements on the left and some unions, there's this kind of, um, I guess, yes, internal conflict in terms of a suspicion or wariness of migration and migrants. Um, and this under, idea of undercutting jobs for those, the working classes. Um, and again, that's a very much a divide and rule tactic that's, you know, whether overtly or subtly um, promulgated by uh, establishment, basically the establishment and um, those who have vested interests in keeping a divided working class. Um, so that's why I re 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 referenced that. Um, in terms of the gen in, in terms of diversion or di di yeah, diversions within the movements, themselves, I, I'm not going to say anything particularly inventive. I would go back to dialogue, into a dialogue amongst ourselves. Um, and I, I think an element of self-education, I think it, I think these type of fora are good because it's bringing people from, bringing um, activists from all walks of life and from all different sectors into one space to hear these diverse perspectives. So I think that's a I think that's a, a, that's a really good place to start. Um, I think within the context of unions and the movements as general, I think there needs to be more of these dialogues fostered, and um, and it's harder with in the context of Zoom. But I think having one to one conversations with people and understanding their context, and understanding their um, where they're coming from, helps to kind of humanize. Um, in terms of things like um, structural things like white supremacy and and um, I think there's a level where you're, you're not going to you're not going to convince everyone. Um, but I do think that if I think the more kind of personal interactions you can have with people and that's why I mentioned earlier about speaking to families and circles of influence, which can be really hard, but where there's like a personal link and it's been said that it tends to be more people tend to take on board what's being said because if someone they know and care about and trust feels enthusiastic about something, it, it, it can have um, a particular effect. It doesn't always work or it might not work immediately. And so also there's an element of patience. I think one thing we need to do is try also to be patient and not to condemn and judge. And that's a lot, it's very hard. It's very hard, particularly if something's close to you and you are, you know, as a woman of African descent, I, you know, I, I always feel that intersectionality is my very much my lived experience in many ways, but then I still occupy areas of privilege. I still occupy, so I think um, I think in terms of uh, having these conversations and even just approaching the topics themselves, you can um, crit critique uh, policies, but try not to make it personal. You can critique certain ideologies, but try not to make it personal. I think also be careful how we throw around certain um, labels, because sometimes generalizations are made about people who hold certain views and certain um, labels are put on them that might be oversimplified. And I think this is where 
I mean, I really tend to think that when you talk about these things in abstract and these divisions in abstract, that's when it becomes really impersonal and dehumanized and you can caricature the person who seems to be on the other side of the argument. But if um, in this kind of context where you can generate dialogue and have and 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 one to one and you know when you're networking and offline and informally, if you can have more of these conversations, it really helps um, because it's a form of education. And um, and obviously, I think in terms of more on the state level, I, I guess it's a different approach and it's more in terms of lobbying and and it's done in and 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 as much as possible, you want to build uh, that solidarity across groups but I guess to build that solidarity where there are these um, fault lines as Monica has, has pointed out um, I think you now that has to start with the one-to-one -one conversations and, and these kind of um, uh, fora as well I hope I've I hope I haven't waffled too long I hope we've got some kind of coherent response from me <laughs> Absolutely, Tala. I think I think all um, words to, words to live by and and things to think about as we go forward in building these building these coalitions and having these these tough one on one conversations and challenging ourselves to continue doing that as a as a feminist movement. Um, I'm going. I have a few other questions um, coming in. Um, this one let's see I'll, I'll i'll throw this one out to the to the group and see see, see who would like to take it um we have a, a question from the q a box um, that says yesterday there was a move um a movement of migrant workers in front of the bangladesh expatriate ministry um for some legal demands but there were no women migrant workers there at that at that event and the question is, does this mean that that feminist organizations are not working properly or what what do we need to do when we see these kinds of um, demonstrations happening where we do not see the um, the people, the group that is um, perhaps most at risk being represented in, in those advocacy um, campaigns? I'm, I'm sure this is something that that all of you on the panel may have experienced at one time or, or another. So um, the. I'll leave the floor open to who wants to to take it first. I see Fish nodding her head, so I don't know if um, if, if <laughs> perhaps I may put you on the spot. And I also see Tala has a hand as well. Uh, yes, indeed, I have a lot of feelings uh, when I read this question. Uh, this is indeed um, a lot of fight um, from, by all of us. Uh, how to um, raise up women's voice, rep voices, representation, and also decision making uh, in the also internally in the organization. Uh, in some countries, whenever there are protests and seminar, even the topics is about women, and it's always the men who stand or sit in the middle and then speaking. Uh, for IWF, uh, we are a global union federation led by women. We have been uh, pushing uh, for women leadership and domestic workers leadership. So um, I can see there are some changes uh, slowly, bit by bit. We do have affiliate who is who used to be male dominated. Uh, but it has been uh, because every time when we organize activities, we always want the domestic workers to have opening remarks and uh, keep on doing um, capacity building of the women domestic workers uh, so that and we always insist the domestic workers organizations belongs to domestic workers. It has to be domestic workers in the leadership uh, in the decision making. Yeah, um, yeah, so. Thanks, Fish. Um, and I'll go, go back to Tola. Hello, I saw that question and I was quite keen to reference it. I think, um, I think don't, it, it's, it's complicated. Um, and I, I think it's great that the question's being asked um, because you noticed. So that's a good start. Um, I'd say, don't be too hard on yourselves. There are multiple factors. And I guess that there'll be things that unite the various contexts, but there will still be culturally specific issues. But just to make a few general, general observations, migrant workers um, uh, generally are afraid to put the head above the parapet because so often they have a very precarious uh, migration status. So making themselves visible is the last thing that 
you know, even, even if they want to for self-preservation, it's it's a real conflict between um, being visible and possibly bringing yourself to the attention of the authorities, which is, which is why it's essential, again, going back to intersectionality, to de uncouple migration from criminality and, and enforcement and, and, and being an administrative, an administrative issue. Because one of the reasons why migrant workers can be exploited is because those that you know bad faith employers know there's there's very little they can do about it so in this kind of gathering you know it's possible even if women knew about it they will be afraid to make themselves visible because it could draw un unwanted attention from their employers and all the authorities um i i'm going to post repost the link in the chat to the report on uh, migrant women from senegal and one of the quite telling things and sad um um one of the quite, I suppose, very disappointing things is so few of them are aware of unions and union activities, um, let alone the instruments from the ILO and instrument, international instruments. Uh, and those who did um, were quite assertive, but there were very few. Um, I think you have to bear in mind that in mo most parts of the world, union activity is heavily resisted by the state's authorities. And um, they are um, they're incredible statistics, even in Europe, in terms of union breaking tactics. So it's hard for unions, for instance. I mean, I'm not saying unions are the only way to organize uh, migrant workers, but you know they're very important, and they need to be, as Fish said, there needs to be migrant led or migrant women led unions. Um, but it's very hard for unions to operate anyway. So organizing them made even more difficult in these hostile environments. To look at the more positive side or the more proactive things we can do, I would say a really important step is approaching organisations and, and, and CSOs or associations that work specifically with migrants. Because it's a really important and excellent potential, potentially excellent alliance building um, initiative. And as I understand it, I think organisations that have been very effective in this area and unions have been, that have been effective in this area have gone to where the migrants are which is you know, maybe cultural um, centers and, and societies. And in fact, the report that I'm going to post again, I think that's how some of the information was gathered because of, of approaching these sorts of organizations that helped um, provide the solidarity for migrants in the country of destination. So uh, I think they're working in concert with the unions in terms of putting them in touch with the women. So it's really, I'd say as a first step is to approach migrant organizations or organizations where you know that they're going to be lots of migrants and that might even include uh, religious institutions or and community groups and uh, and and reach out to them there and it's and i think you'd build you can build some really powerful alliances there in terms of just also raising awareness amongst these groups of what is faced and i think together you can you can fortify you can join your forces and be in, and being greater than the sum of your parts so i hope that helps Thank you, Tala, and thank you, Fish, both for your responses and, and to Ani Sur from the Awaj Foundation in Bangladesh for that very thought-provoking question. And I, I think something that you just said, Tala, is a good transition to the next question on my list is, is that you mentioned that at times, especially um, migrant workers and women migrant workers um, may experience uh, increased violence or um, discrimination as a result of their activism and their advocacy. Advocacy. And so we, we have a question um, from Maria, who's a member of an Indonesian um, domestic worker, migrant worker unions, and she's asking, and I, I think perhaps Francia, this question may be directed to you, but others may answer as well, is are, are there any shelters um, or what kind of support services are available um, for, especially for women migrant workers who may experience uh, violence and, and harassment, especially as part of their advocacy work? Bueno, actualmente en Nicaragua no contamos con, con la capacidad económica para montar un albergue que, que sirva como refugio para, para, para las personas migrantes que vienen de retorno. Pero sabemos la existencia y tenemos una libreta de contactos de albergues en diferentes fronteras, ya que sabemos que la migración de Nicaragua es Nicaragua, Estados Unidos, y tienen que pasar por países de la región como lo es Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, llegar a México y después a Estados Unidos. Se cuenta con una libreta de contacto, de apoyo de albergues y organizaciones migrantes 
que pueden dar refugio, alimentos y acompañamiento a las personas que están en proceso o en tránsito de migración. Acá en Nicaragua no contamos con un albergue que apoye a, la, a, a las trabajadoras domésticas, este, migrantes retornadas, ya sea cisgénero, o sea transgénero o de la comunidad LGBTI, pero consideramos que es muy importante eh, tomarlo en cuenta, incluirlo dentro de nuestros objetivos, eh, dentro de nuestras estrategias, porque actualmente tenemos un gran fenómeno de nicaragüenses retornados hacia el país y en situación de desempleo por motivos de la pandemia. Sabemos que en Nicaragua no hubo oficialmente una cuarentena. Esto facilitó la movilización de personas que todavía se movilizan porque actualmente en Nicaragua, en el contexto de la pandemia, no existen tantas restricciones porque el gobierno lo decretó de esta manera, sino que cada quien asumió su propia responsabilidad. Este, en Nicaragua van a haber este movimiento normal todo el día. De hecho, nunca dejó de ser así por las medidas que, que no se tomaron. Y actualmente este, no tenemos ese mecanismo o no contamos con esa herramienta tan importante como lo son los albergues asistenciales de apoyo psicosocial y apoyo en salud a personas migrantes retornadas o en proceso de migración. Pero es muy importante retomarlo e incluirlo para que tal vez sea un planteamiento de cara al sindicato en un futuro trabajo. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Francia. And, and I'll go back to Fish. I saw your hand also raised. Would you like to respond to this? Yes, uh, thanks, Maria from SBMI, the Indonesian migrant workers in the U uh, in Indonesia to raise this question. Um, basically, the destination uh, in Asia, in Middle East, in the Gulf, the destination country government do not provide shelter and any assistance at all to migrant domestic workers or migrants uh, in general. So even in Hong Kong, Singapore, um, in the Middle East and the Gulf, uh, the destination governments always rely on the sending country, meaning the embassies to provide the services uh, and the NGOs who has limited uh, financial resource to, to provide this. So we still have a lot to fight because without shelter, without um, a means for the migrant workers to stay in order to file their labor case at the court or tribunal, uh, uh, to have a living means, to have a shelter to stay, they cannot have access to justice. Um, the Hong Kong Federation of Domestic Workers Unions uh, recently published uh, a documentary uh, the price of justice. Um, you will you will know uh, the issue uh, from the documentary. I put the link there. Uh, I think only Taiwan. The government is providing subsidies to NGOs to provide shelter, and then the embassies, uh, Indonesian, uh, for example, they have some shelter, but it is very much uh, restricted. For example, the workers who stay in the shelter of the Indonesian embassy or consulate, they, uh, um, they have time that they cannot go out uh, in the evening and cannot con have make contact. So those workers staying at the Indonesian embassy, uh, uh, we will lose the contact with the workers uh, for those unions and NGOs who are ex assisting the workers. So it is a huge, issue, uh, so we have to work a lot on this. Thank you, Fish and, and Francia both, and thank you for, for raising that out, that something as fundamental as shelter is essential to workers being able to access other forms of justice, including um, reclaiming wages that have been stolen by the employer and accessing justice on a broader scale. So this is certainly something that needs to be at the heart of our campaigns. Um, I, I also see Jill's hand raised, would you like to respond as well to this question or, or any of the others? Um, yeah, in, I, I would like to um, um, respond to the access to have a shelter. I mean, and also in relation to the 
um, what Tola mentioned in relation to the uh, workers in Bangladesh uh, in front of the, uh, having the strike. Um, for example, in, um, in the Netherlands, people uh, who are undocumented has very uh, difficult access to shelters. It has to do with their migration status. Um, I had a case um, last uh, two days ago who, who was a victim of sexual violence and I was trying to find uh, psychological support for her and also a shelter, but eventually, um, although it's a priority, but still it's, she did not, she was not able to have access to those, um, to psychological support and also shelter. At first we need to, uh, it, it needs to be designated that she's a victim of human trafficking, for example, or sexual violence. So those administrative mesh, uh, administrative categorization are also um, sometimes um, uh, therefore very difficult for people to have access. And another example in relation to um, the question on the Bangladesh uh, workers, uh, like for example, now in Hungary where migration is actually really uh, very criminalized, um, migrant workers who are organizing themselves have difficulties giving visibility to their, um, to their action because if they will be um, even posting something on Facebook or posting something about, um, about their uh, experiences can cause uh, uh, them being detained or them being, um, uh, uh, how do you call that, um, uh, in their security threat. And also, I agree with Dola, um, many uh, issues on the ground are sometimes very much complicated and the picture does not say uh, everything. So that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Thank, thank you, Jill. Thank you for those excellent points. A uh, reminder that nothing is black and white in the work that we do. And I want to thank um, all of our panelists and participants for this, this lively conversation in the question and answer. I'm going to, we're about at time. Um, so thank you everyone for sticking with us. I'm going to hand it back to my colleague, Carol, to close us out. Sorry, just before you hand back, um, so I just want something that I thought that I should have quite important. I should have just added to my um, intervention earlier in terms of um, talking about solid building solidarity. I think um, it's again, it's a really obvious point, but point finding the points of interest oh, and highlighting the points of interest, such as my, migrants' rights and human rights, and like I said earlier, in terms of um, improved working conditions for migrants will be improved working conditions for all work, workers and, and wages. But also um, we need to have things that are fundamental, but also not to be too, um, I don't know what the right word is, pedantic or too um, rigid about what those bottom lines are. And by that, I mean that there might be points of um, uh, perspective that might, might be very different and might come from very divergent worldviews. And, um, and they're not necessarily worth the whole thing fragmenting over. So um, I think if you emphasize the points of commonality amongst the movement and what you know across the board can be fought for, there might be other more philosophical or theological questions that will continue to be points of difference and tension. And that essentially isn't a bad thing, it's how we handle those tensions. I think sometimes, um, as particularly on, on the left, there's such a focus on, you know, doctrinal purity <laughs> that you can end up, you know, throwing the baby out of the bathwater. And I think we just, but I, I said that has to be negotiated. That's not something that can easily be, but, you know, we need to have the discussion. So I just wanted to add that. A fantastic last word. Thank you. Thank you, Tala, for that. Uh, all right, uh, ba uh, back to you, Carol, to, to close us out for the day. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. And thanks, Tola. That's a, a fantastic way to close us out. Um, I, I think that it, it's been a very rich discussion. And I want to remind you uh, that there is the fifth session um, it will focus on organizing. Um, and so we'll continue this conversation. And uh, we want to be building towards um, some strategies about 
um, how we move forward together. And this is not just a web webinar series. It's, uh, it's also doing the kind of dialogues and um, building relationships that some of you spoke about today so that we can think about how we move forward together. So keep that in mind and join us on um, the next session. Uh, I want to give special thanks to Gat W for providing all of the uh, amazing logistics uh, for uh, and, and planning and anchoring us in, in this process. I wanna thank the interpreters who make this possible and a shout out to the co-sponsors to Flex Solidarity Center, AWID Women, um, along with GAT W in doing this. Um, I wanna thank Paula Simed who organized this particular event uh, for all of the work that she put into it. I think we've heard today that um, we need to work at multiple levels of advocacy, the essential role of grassroots leadership and leadership of those who are directly affected in uh, defining uh, the agenda, in uh, voicing the concerns, in being at the negotiating table, and then in doing accountability. Uh, we need to work at multiple levels of advocacy. So from the very grassroots to the national, to um, the global arenas. And we've talked about getting conventions and normative frameworks um, adopted at the global level um, and, and what it takes to do that. And then that it's essential to implement that into national law. And then it's absolutely essential to organize, to be vigilant about um, how, how that gets implemented. And we talked about the, um, the tensions and uh, complexity of, of building alliances and working in coalitions um, with, with different um, identity and sectoral interest groups and um, the uh, comments that Tilla made at the end about um, keeping our eyes on the prize in, in, in coalitions about what we, we have in common um, so that we can um, have some of these successes. So we've covered a lot of ground and um, I uh, will close us out with a, a deep thank you to uh, the amazing, courageous women who've shared with us today. Um, to uh, Tala, to Jill, to Fish, to Francia, um, who are, are doing this work day in and day out and working with uh, women in the sectors where you're working um, uh, to organize and claim space. And uh, we appreciate your sharing uh, what you're doing and how you're doing it. But more than that, we appreciate the work that you do. So uh, with that, we'll close out and um, please join us in the next session. And uh, we'll, we'll keep seeing how we build from one session to the other so that we can um, uh, take steps after this in the future. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Have a good thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.